two, one, and we are live with Max Kaiser on the Sunny Ray Show. I am pumped about this one. How are you, Max? Sunny Ray Show. It sounds so good. I'm excited. It's sunny. Right. It's sunny Ray. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening, buddy. How's your day so far? Pretty awesome, man. You know, I'm loving lockdown. It's been the best time of my life. I get mm. to hang out with Stacy all day. We make our shows right here. Do my keto baking in the kitchen, working on my recipes. You know, I'm getting trim, lean, fit, ready for the apocalypse. Love it. Love it. We're getting ready for the apocalypse. I know it's been, it's been bittersweet as well on this end. You know, I just, uh, just yesterday, uh, we moved out of the downtown core. We've been there for, for quite a while and we just left and got into a house. <laughs> oh, right. Just to, yeah. Just to get a, just to de-risk ourselves a bit. All right, Max. So what do you say we uh, jump into this? I had a couple questions I wanted to go through, but before we do, is there anything you want? Well, you know, we just launched the Orange Pill podcast a few weeks ago. It's already mm -hmm. burning up the podcasting charts, Max and Stacy. We got the weekly Orange Pill podcast on Sundays. Then we do during the week, the micro dosing of the Orange Pill, which is a live stream. And uh, it's really captured the imagination of the community and it's crossing over to a wider audience. I expect we'll be surpassing Joe Rogan probably in another two, three weeks. Love it. I <laughs> love it. Okay, awesome. Yes, I've been see hearing the buzz and I am excited about that too. Hey, Max, you know, before we get in, just to set a bit of context, um, you know, I probably mentioned this to you before, but you were one of the first people uh, back in, oh my goodness, I think it was 2011, 2012 days when I first started learning about Bitcoin that I'd heard, you know, your voice and your enthusiasm and your conviction towards the orange pill back then i mean now it's kind of the the cool thing to be in with bitcoin but back then it was eh, it was, wasn't so cool was it um and so i just wanted to maybe take our, our you know our listeners back there but before even that you know another piece i was really interested in was what's your kind of backstory like where, where, where are you from you know um you know i've heard bits and pieces of it on the on the internet but i wanted to just give you a chance to, to you know just share your story i think it's quite uh, compelling Right. Well, back in 2011, we had already been doing Kaiser Report for a couple of years and we were mostly into gold and we featured a lot of heterodox thinkers and gold people and alternative economic schools and really focusing on why banks were really massively uncredible and causing a lot of problems. Then we were introduced to Bitcoin in 2011 by John Matonis who came on the show. And I saw it immediately as gold uh, 2.0 or digital gold and how it solved this problem of digital scarcity. You know, back in the early nineties, I was involved with the Hollywood Stock Exchange. I invented digital currencies at that time. I have a patent on that. And it's all about creating digital scarcity, which is hard to do. And at that time it was just a gaming environment. And uh, so I saw immediately that Bitcoin had solved this problem, which a lot of people thought was impossible to solve. So we started getting involved. Now, Kaiser Report goes out to 100 countries. We've got tens of millions of viewers. And like yourself and others in just every corner of the world, they were watching our show. They heard about Bitcoin. And once you hear about it, you know, you get curious about it and you start going down the rabbit hole. And uh, so we have probably several hundred thousand Bitcoin millionaires that we've created since 2011, because you know, it's not hard to do that if you start buying at a dollar, right? So, um, and this carried us all the way through into the present and we've seen and witnessed and being a part of every single major development in Bitcoin since then, uh, particularly in 2017 with the block wars was probably the final major chapter in the story before Bitcoin started to just run away with the entire market. Michael Saylor over at MicroStrategies, who just bought $425 million of the Bitcoin, said that that block size war going on in 2017 is when he totally convinced him that Bitcoin was here to stay and it was real and that he needed to own some because it had gone through the fire of that, of that, uh, that skirmish, if you will. And so all these things are very important. And Bitcoin, in my view, around block 300,000 became self-aware. And the Genesis block was sent to us by divine, uh, the divine uh, entity. And it's pulling humanity away from uh, fiat money, which is if left unchecked, will, will kill us all, will become extinct. 
Uh, it's not even clear now that we won't become extinct even now, but with Bitcoin, there is a possibility that we won't become extinct, uh, which certainly is, uh, would be a healthier outcome than extinction. Uh, it does this by replacing fiat money with absolute scarcity. It's the only thing in the universe that really has this quality of absolute scarcity and used as money. It means you're defunding war, you're defunding fraud, you're defunding central banks, you're defunding Wall Street, you're defunding all the failed economic schools like Keynesianism, you're defunding um, greed, you're defunding the ego, you're defunding uh, lots of stuff, and you are funding love, you're funding peace, you're funding community, you're funding sustainability, and that's the, that's the transition. We're going from being a nearly extinct civilization and species to uh, getting a reprieve from God because Bitcoin came to us from God. Uh, so that's my Bitcoin story. Love it, love it. Uh, so I am—I always say I'm not—I'm not religious, but I am religious about Bitcoin. So I feel a lot of that rhetoric there. Um, Max, I'm curious about one thing. Prior to 2011, um, like how did you come to Bitcoin? Uh, you know, again, back then you struck me as someone who. I don't know, maybe it was a bit philosophical. It seemed like you were thinking about these like deeper things, right? Like most people, I don't even find ask the, ask the question, what is money, let alone go down that rabbit hole. So I'm curious, um, you know, in terms of like your, like where are you from? You're from the United States, I assume. And, and uh, you know, are you, are you an econ guy? Are you a business guy? Were you doing, like, were you a philosopher? Like, wh where are you from? I come from Wall Street. Mm. Right. So Wall Street was my first job out of university, New York University. And I started working as a uh, broker, stock broker on Wall Street, 1982. And I uh, did, did that for many years. And so I was a deep student of Wall Street and um, was particularly interested in price, price discovery, how prices um, really um, are... Um, come into existence, you know, for securities, what goes into that, the, the way specialists operate to create markets and market making. And um, this was a factor for me then in the, as I said, in the mid 1990s, 1995, 1996, I was the co-founder of the Hollywood Stock Exchange in Los Angeles. And this was um, originally going to be a project dedicated to creating box office futures contracts to allow studios to hedge their production costs. And my partner and I looked into that for a couple of months and then it became clear that the cost of launching something like that was pretty exorbitant. So I came up with the idea and I said, why don't we create a virtual market on the internet? It was, the internet had just been really commercialized with the Netscape browser and Netscape going public. And so the internet now is a consumer item, uh, really in, the, in 1994, I guess that would be. And then by 95, it started to uh, really catch on, as we all know. Uh, so we went ahead and we created this virtual Hollywood box office based stock market. And uh, within a few months of that, it was clear that the price discovery technology required for this exchange had to be invented from scratch because you're, you're dealing in virtual securities with a virtual market maker and a, and a virtual, um, mar and a virtual currency, virtual securities and a virtual market maker. So these three things had to be, uh, you have to create a technology where you, simulated the stock market with a high degree of verisimilitude. So that was my goal was I wanted to create a facsimile of the, of, of a market stock market digitally and virtually. And the securities all had a underlying base value tied to trailing box office, right? So box office runs Hollywood and the trailing box office was the, was the foundational metric that you would have a valuation for all these movie stars and, and, and star, star bonds and movie stocks as we call them. So I uh, went to work on that technology. We tried to do it in house for a while. Then we realized it's a much bigger project. So we went to a firm called Cambridge Technology Partners in, um, in Los Angeles. And uh, I camped out there for a few months. And uh, we pretty much created the architecture for this price discovery technology for trading virtual securities 
with a virtual currency. So you have to be able, so the technology creates digital scarcity, um, but it does so in, in, you know, compared to Bitcoin, it's very clumsy. So the way, you know, I can go into the minutia of how the technology actually accomplishes this, but the, the, the bottom line is, um, unlike let's say a gaming platform where you're winning a magical potion that gives you a, a step up in the game, the virtual specialist technology has to create price parity over thousands of securities simultaneously. So it's not like a blockchain per se, but it, it, it addresses the entire market on a minute by minute basis. And, and it looks for price parity within all these securities simultaneously. And then it adjusts the market making algorithm accordingly to make sure that it doesn't stray unreasonably beyond what we would consider to be the underlying box office fundamental value of that market. And it also takes into consideration a lot of anomalies in that market. For example, in, in 1995, you know, the internet was 98% white men. And so projects in Hollywood that were, had black actors or black directors were um, underpriced uh, because the demographics weren't there to support it. So the virtual specialist uh, would adjust the uh, pricing algorithm accordingly. And it would be uh, by comparison, easier to create an uptick for a project with a black director than one with a not a black director. Again, the, the, because you, the, the goal being that you need simultaneously, simultaneous price parity over this universe of securities, taking into consideration all these variables. Because it is a gaming environment where people are using play money, essentially, you get, you're given 2 million Hollywood dollars to start. So the actors on the exchange are not behaving rationally because it's not real money, they're given this free money. So you have to have a way to overcome the irrationality by keep and, and make it game-like, right? The game has to function in a competitive or pseudo competitive way. Um, we had the problem of 80% of all new buyers on the exchange would be buying Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio and so his uh, star bond would be 3000%, you know, higher than anything else in the exchange given the simple supply and demand. So, uh, which is, which is not um, acceptable for many reasons. So um, we that you have to make in all, all those considerations. So the, the pricing market making algorithm had roughly 21 different variables that are uh, every, every, every uh, 10 minutes is a clear, all prices are cleared every 10 minutes, which I think we got that down to one minute, but initially it was every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes, similar to uh, Bitcoin, the, um, every single security on the blockchain was not audited, but it was uh, cross, cross referenced against many variables and the market conditions and a lot of other stuff. And then we generate an internal price that is for internal purposes because we, we operated as, as, as the specialist behind the virtual specialist. So uh, it gives us a chance to um, eyeball the market. But again, but we didn't want to be in the business of making markets on thousands of securities all day long because we'd have to hire a bunch of people to do that. So this is all done autonomously by one you know, program. And so anyway, this thing got really, really popular and we got a million users within uh, under a year. And it was the most traded exchange in the world at that time by number of, you know, volume. Okay, it's play money, I understand that, but it still had the most traffic of any exchange in the world. Uh, we were gonna go public in uh, 2001 with Bear Stearns. Then at the last minute, we got a competing deal to buy us out from Cantor Fitzgerald uh, on Wall Street. They then moved the entire thing to the top floor of the World Trade Center. And then just three, three months later, it was 9-11 and they got wiped out. Oh. Uh, that's the whole the story ends there pretty much. That's oh the end of the story. Okay, so I, that's a couple of things. So just to kind of, um, you know, bring it back to your shirt, I, in terms of, I'm curious. So there's a couple things I heard about, you know, you obviously had kind of deep Wall Street, like financial background. So you understood how that system worked or maybe where it didn't. 
uh, work so well. Um, then you were also had this affinity towards gold and just seems like digital scarcity was this common theme that you were trying to, you, were, you always knew was going to be important um, because of your, your relationship with gold. And then you're trying to kind of bring that into the virtual world. Um, well, not and so much you, with gold so much, but mm, with uh, market making and price discovery mm, itself. You know, the Nobel Prize winners in economics this past week won it for their work on auctions. Hmm. Yeah, I read that. Okay. Right. And, and a, a specialist program is what's called a double auction system. So the buyers and the sellers are holding a simultaneous auction. And um, so there's a lot of work that still can be done with this auctions. I think my hmm. patent, the virtual specialist patent is, is a variation on that double auction system done on Wall Street, except it's purely automated. There's also a function. We had our Hollywood Reserve Bank, which controlled money. And it tied that to price discovery, which is something lacking in our current economy because mm. the price discovery on Wall Street is not tied directly on a continuous basis to the Fed. The Fed makes policy and policy decisions and they meet every month or every quarter to adjust policy, which is a huge lag time and completely ineffectual. With my technology, it's actually every 10 minutes during the price discovery cycles, the, the Hollywood Reserve Bank was factored into and interest rates were adjusted accordingly. And a lot of times when you had a Leonardo DiCaprio sometimes it would make the whole bond market go up sharply, then the Hollywood Reserve Bank would raise interest rates automatically. And this would force a lot of players on the exchange to dump bonds in Leonardo and park their money in cash because it was yielding 7%. So we had, a, you know, it was a very dynamic, multidisciplinary system. We also had the Hollywood Investment Bank, which took these uh, securities public every day. We had Hollywood Reserve Bank. We had Max Broker, which was a character in the game who was everybody's broker. Cool. We had uh, the virtual specialist twins. So the, two, hmm. the specialist was represented as a cartoon by two, two of these um, kind of uh, punked out chicks, rock chicks. And they were the twins and they were making markets, you know, that was our character, our, our characterization of that function of that technology. And then they, you know, these characters took on lives of their own. There was a comic strip about them and we, we put that out there and they were always interacting with each other. And um, there was a lot of, there was at one point an effort to, somebody was going to create a theme restaurant based on the Hollywood Stock Exchange with these characters. Mm. And, and, the, and the ticker tape was, it would be in the restaurant. Yeah. We moved to offices in West Hollywood and we, we spent $600,000 actually building a ticker tape from a firm in Vegas to go on top of this building on Olive Street in West Hollywood. Um, and, you know, so we really got into the simulation. So then with Bitcoin, uh, you know, in 2011, I'm looking at this technology and I'm thinking, well, all of the uh, parameters we use to make markets here are no longer needed because the uh of the, the the it's a cryptocurrency and and all the technology all that goes into the stack the bitcoin stack is um is a quantum leap you know beyond a virtual currency you know during the 90s a lot of virtual currencies came out there was beans uh there was something called flows then there's the hollywood dollar which was a hollywood stock exchange and there was a few different ways of diff different attempts to do virtual currencies but cryptocurrency actually created absolute scarcity um, and it was um, decentralized, absolute scarcity, which is different because for, in my case with the Hollywood Stock Exchange, it was centralized for sure. And uh, it wasn't absolute uh, scarcity, it was relative scarcity. And, 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 uh, and Max, I was going to say on, on that point, because like a lot of people in India, obviously, and in all over the world love gold. And when I say things like Bitcoin has absolute uh, you know, certainty in terms of the number of Bitcoins that will ever exist and there's scarcity kind of built in and it's decentralized. It's people look at me really funny, right? So I'm just curious, like, uh, just for maybe a lot of the people out there, because I do feel this is one of the most exciting and important things about Bitcoin and often gets, you know, overlooked by all the, the hype and the media and everything, right? So I'm curious, um, you know, you know, when, when was that kind of aha moment for you? And you're like, wait, this is actually scarce, like more scarce than potentially even gold because, you know, tomorrow Elon Musk could find an asteroid with, with gold in it. You know, they could find an Indian temple that has an infinite amount of, you know, gold underneath it that they've, you know, just found and whatnot. So, so I'm curious, not an infinite amount, but a large amount, which has happened in recent years. I'm curious, like, uh, how do you, how do you, what was, the, uh, what, what kind of like, 
technological innovation within the Bitcoin network. Um, and I feel it has something to do with the decentralization element. Did you feel kind of really enable that leap to happen? Because there's been many attempts, right, even in the past to try to make something that's digital that's scarce. But it's, it's so counterintuitive because nothing digital is scarce. <laughs> right. So digital scarcity uh, going back to the 90s. So you had the internet came along first and then you had <laughs> gaming. Games come along and games attempt to create digital scarcity with game pieces and and other aspects in those games like Magic Sword or Magic Potion. And those ended up being traded on a secondary market on eBay, uh, which you could, someone would sell their Magic Potion to a game on eBay and people would buy that and then put it into their game uh, to give them kind of a jump ahead in, in winning the game or being big in that game. You had a Second Life, which is a virtual exchange. that had their own currency, the Linden dollar, which was uh, traded independently of the game for a value. And um, so you already had distributed digital distribution of, um, of, of, of uh, scarce, digitally scarce distributed um, files or objects or money, if you want to call it that. And that was uh, clicking along nicely. And um, so again, when you, see the, when you see the white paper and you see the Bitcoin protocol, you notice that it, it enjoy, it has absolute scarcity because the, there's a 21 million coin limit. And um, okay, that's, that's, that's nice. But then the fact that it's distributed the way it is, so you have distributed scarcity, distributed digital scarcity, but you put all those three things together and you're like, okay, this is like a whole different, you could use this as money. The, you know, the reason you can't use a game piece in a, in a simulation in a game like a magic sword. You can't go to the deli and buy a sandwich with a, with a magical digital sword, even though on eBay it might be worth 10 bucks or 20 bucks. You know, the guy in the deli won't accept it because there's no, you cannot reasonably have an expectation that the, that the operators of that game won't increase the, the number of digital swords, of magic swords. They may say they won't. They may say that it's a limited supply but in fact, it's a centralized organization and they could get hacked. Uh, they, the, the owners could flake out. So there's no, there's no real uh, guarantee that that will be um, um, absolutely scarce. So you can't really use it as money. So it's not going to cross mm -hmm. over to the general economy in a real way. It'll be a novelty on eBay. The Hollywood dollars, by the way, were being sold on eBay as well. So we, we maintain an exchange rate of a million to one that we would buy any, any Hollywood dollars that showed up on eBay, we would buy them at an exchange rate of a million to one. So now suddenly this free money that we were giving away, people would play the game for six months. We gave them 2 million Hollywood dollars. They play the game for six months. And let's say they've got now 30 million Hollywood dollars. They could go to eBay and get 30 bucks for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we were, that was the first con fully convertible digital the currency probably in the world ever. And, um, so, but again, it wouldn't, it would be, you're still in that gaming environment. So like the, the thing about Linden, the second life in Linden dollars is that people would migrate to second life and they would live in second life mm. and they would use the Linden dollar as their currency. But the question was, could you create a digitally scarce currency for life outside of a game? And that's what Bitcoin does. It takes everything you would find in a gaming currency, but you can use it you know, outside of a game. You can use it every single day because it has distributed absolute scarcity, which is unique. And it's, and it's an invention. It was invented with the 2008 white paper. You know, the technology dropped in 2009. Hmm. Was, it was until that moment, it had never existed before. And, and yes, you can use it as money. And it's the only absolutely scarce money that we've ever seen. In the case of gold, to get back to the gold question, the gold, we know that gold supply is inflating by 2% a year right now, just through technological, just through mining. We know that if gold were suddenly to go to $10,000 an ounce, then the mining technology would improve and that inflation rate would probably go above 2%. Just like we saw in the oil industry, when oil became scarce in the United States and price was 147, they invented fracking. And suddenly mm -hmm. the oil the oil price crashed. So there's no reason not to think that if gold gets to five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars an ounce or higher, that the technology to mine gold won't improve exponentially and the supply will go from two percent a year to ten, fifteen percent a year. Plus you've got the possibility of sea mining. There's 
trillions of ounces in the sea. You've got asteroid mining, uh, which is uh, now no longer science fiction. It's like within the realm of the science possi possible. So the gold is not absolutely scarce. It's, it, it is scarce and it is distributed. You find gold everywhere in the world, it is scarce. And after many trials and errors over thousands of years, it became the most favorite, favorable form of money. And what is money? What is money? Money is something that you can store energy in and use it in the future. So uh, a gold ounce today, um, I, I, it represents um, a lot of, um, of energy. And a year from now, uh, I can unlock that energy by spending it. And so it, it, it locks it in a, in a, in a form that's um, portable, divisible, fungible. It's pretty, it shines. You can make it into jewelry and stuff if you want, although that, that, that's not at all has to do with its, it, its uh, use as money. You can use it in electronics, but again, that's completely outside of its use as money. It doesn't make any difference if gold could be used. Gold does, do, would, can have zero utility value and it would still work perfectly as money. The, there's no, the utility value has nothing to do with money. The Mises regression theorem is false. I think I proved that in the 1990s with my work and my patent on the Hollywood dollar. It's, you don't need a utility value whatsoever for something to be used as money. All you need is that people want to use it as money. That's what makes money money. People want to use it. And so they will gravitate toward whatever is the most dense, the densest form of energy that is portable, yet portable and divisible and has all these other, other qualities. So of all the elements on the periodic table, gold emerged as the perfect uh, for money up until uh, the creation of Bitcoin. And it has a few drawbacks, but it was, it's used as money. So then in 2009, you've had Bitcoin was released and it does everything gold does. Instead of being very, very scarce, it's absolutely scarce. So that makes it that much better on the scarcity side. It's more portable, it's more divisible. It's, it's got all these other qualities, but a lot better. So it's an improvement on gold in many ways. And you also have now for the first time, millions and billions of people connected electronically and they want it and gold makes so much more sense. I mean, the Bitcoin makes more sense than trying to, than gold because gold, you know, you can't, it's very hard to transport gold. You can't send it as an email attachment. You can't move it through an airport and really when in size and it's, it's not, it's, it's not a practical. And um, so, so Bitcoin, fills all, checks all the boxes, creates new boxes, and then checks those boxes. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is energy, and, and I also see it as, as time, right? Like, by the more time I invest into Bitcoin, the more time I get to do the things I love to do in my life, like spend time with my kids, go for a swim, because I feel like, you know, my 10 years of my life when I was just devoting my life to fiat, at the end of the month, there'd be more month than money. <laughs> you know, after you pay the taxes, after you take into account inflation, after you take into account just the fact how it devalues over time, um, it just felt like you're always like this hamster, like trying to catch up, whereas Bitcoin kind of reverses that, that cycle and uh, very interesting. But yeah, well, sir, maybe, maybe energy is not, you know, think, when the thing you say that there's energy, there's energy in gold, people will say, wait a minute, you're, you're espousing labor theory of value which I'm not talking about the labor theory of value. I'm not saying that there's labor involved in mining, therefore it has value. Mm. And I mean, to be more to your point about space and time, I think is the way to attack this. So the, the, what's, what possess, what's in that ounce of gold is the ability to travel through space and time. You can, try, you can go forward in time and with the value of today, right? It doesn't degrade. It doesn't mm. fall apart. If you were to put all of your value into rice, you know, a few years after that, it would, you know, be messed up. Uh, it's not, it doesn't work as money, but gold g gives you the chance to travel through time with your value, the value mm. that you have, that, that you, that you have a 99.9% .9 certainty will be accepted in the future for as value. It'll have value in the future. So you can travel through time in that sense. Mm. So energy, I guess, 
Well, you know what you're saying, and you know, and it made me think a little bit. As we know, you know, energy, time, and space are on on the periphery of the multiverse are interchangeable, right? Yeah. So they're not really distinct. Time and space are the same. Mm -hmm. um, energy equals mass. I believe Einstein made that famous equation. Mm -hmm. And um, so here you have a gold coin that's both energy and mass that can be, you can travel through time with it. So it has that magical property. It's backed mm -hmm. by magic. Let's say, let's say it's backed by magic. Now you can, the problem in saying it's backed by magic is that people, it's too difficult for the <laughs> average human, um, you know, mind or consciousness to deal with magic in any way, even though we're surrounded by magic all the time, like everything, the amount of magic we deal with every single day is astounding. If you think about it, um, just, um, things that are, are even our own body, what's happening in our own body is on the subconscious level is incredible. The amount of, you know, antibodies going after uh, viruses and bacteria and things. Our mind is not, you know, we're not thinking about that 24 hours a day, are we? It's all, it's all on this automatic, automatic, magical path. You know, it's just. Yeah. Oh, no, I forget the exact quote, but I just tweeted out yesterday something along the lines of how like, you know, engineering kind of is magic. Like, and it's, and it's mostly because, you know, we don't, not everyone knows kind of everything that's going on behind it, but like what's happening, like this, like Elon spaceship or whatever, the Tesla um, that drives itself, which, you know, my, my car actually drives itself, Max, like, and it seems like, oh, well, whatever, you know, it, everyone's Tesla does, but it's like, it drives itself, like it's actually happening and it's magical. Um, I wanted to touch on one thing. I had a bunch of other questions, but I, I just thought I wanted to touch, you mentioned something. You said that you felt that at a certain block level, Bitcoin became aware. And the question I have is, I, I spent nearly 10 years in robotics, right? My, my wife's a mechatronics engineer. We, we love 3D printers, the left of me, quad rotors, the right of me, we love robots. Um, Tesla in the garage, we, and, and I, believe well i guess forget what i believe i'm curious to know what you believe around this coming kind of you know artificial intelligence isn't something that's in you know nerdy books like in elon musk's talk i mean everyone's talking about it now people are talking about things like you know ubi and they're talking about um you, you know essentially us giving birth to this new form of intelligence that'll be far smarter um, and more capable than than humans First of all, you believe that. Uh, and second of all, if you do, um, how might Bitcoin play a role in this new future of ours? Or I don't know if you've well, thought about that. Well, first of all, I think artificial intelligence and Bitcoin compete with each other for energy. That's one thing that I believe in. Mm. So in other words, Bitcoin has an insatiable need for energy. So does artificial intelligence. So one of them is going to win. And it, they can't both win. And Bitcoin is working for humans and artificial intelligence is working for the robots. So if we want a human future, we want Bitcoin to win the war for energy. Because what, they got 120, 130 quintillion transactions per second now. Bitcoin takes up like a little less than one half of 1% of global, all global energy. Mm -hmm. And th those numbers are rising and they're gonna be, in, they're battling each other. They're, they're in contention with each other. And we want Bitcoin to win that war. But in terms of Bitcoin being self-aware, you know, look at any engineering project and Let's take a car, for example, right? You start off with a horse and then you see how the car kind of evolved from a motorized horse and carriage model. And then, you know, over time, the human, the human uh, the aspect of the design came into play. So as, as humans made the car more like to serve them as human, not just to be a, 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 a better horse. So, so the, the car is, and now you talk about autonomous driving cars. And I mean, that's a human, that's a human design element. Like we want to go to this place and we don't want to mess around by having to drive the car. We just want to sit back and, you know, have lunch or read a book. And so that was, it's the design is at the service of a human need. And so design goes down that path all the time. And there's a lot of things happening on the subconscious and unconscious level. And, and so with Bitcoin, what, what happened and why it exists and the course of its progress is how there was a need for an absolutely scarce digital gold 
And as that design came to fruition through the various iterations of the cyberpunk movement, including Hashcash and Digicash and the Hollywood dollar and all these attempts, so going back 20 years, at some point, and even Adam Back says, this is the secret sauce of Bitcoin that makes it different than Hashcash. That, that point, that design aspect is the difficulty adjustment part, the stack uh, layer of the Bitcoin stack. So that difficulty adjustment, which was put in by us humans, when added to the rest of the design protocol, you end up with a technology that not only is it a reflection of us, but it knows us in a way that reaches very, very, very deep into our collective unconscious. So that the difficulty adjustment, which happens every two weeks, is guiding us to, in tweaking us. It, it tweaks us because, or it hacks us because it appeals to our underlying greed, which is part of our survival instinct. Our biological survival instinct favors greed in many ways. And so it tickles the greed factor of our being to, but not too much. And um, if in fact confidence is lost in the coin and the miners go off the network and the hash rate drops, the difficulty adjustment will go down to find that sweet spot that gets just enough greed for miners to put capital at risk to go mine more Bitcoin. And, and when it gets too high, uh, the difficulty adjustment will rise uh, accordingly be, and um, we'll put the brakes on so that it doesn't feed the community with too many Bitcoin. And you end up with that distribution model of every 10 minutes mm -hmm. on an accelerating scale. So that, that, those designs, if I were God and I were trying to figure out how do I get humans to wean themselves off of fiat money with an absolutely scarce gold, uh, that's how I would design it. But of mm. course, I'm not God. And, but, and you could say that it doesn't necessarily mean that God designed Bitcoin, but you could say that humans and their millennia long history of curiosity and design were, were putting in these things um, in a way that touches on a, a subliminal divine global unconscious thread that is beyond. I mean, you say that you don't believe in religion or this is not religious or what is religion, but um, what I think it is a quasi religious uh, concept when you, when you understand or you think about how the interface between humans and nature is at, at, at simultaneously extremely awkward, but then also at the same time, completely seamless. So it's, you know, it's, it's a paradox in many ways. I mean, we humans live at, at, in a world and in an existence that's entirely paradoxical, unlike any other species, I would suggest, because I think every other species has very strong instinctual tendencies that drive them and they don't have existential crisis. They're not going to therapy sessions, right? They're not, they're not um, anxiety ridden because they're not separate from nature. Only humans are completely, have a, have a life, have a dual life being with nature and dualistically apart from nature. So that's where religion tries to solve, tries to square that circle. It tries to say, well, there is a paradox, but don't be afraid of the paradox here's a way to live with the paradox. And every religion has its own um, different uh, rules and ceremonies and rituals and hierarchies. And the whole thing is to get people to not, to not stress out about the fact that we, we are dualistic and have a dual existence. Um, and, and none have worked. Ultimately, every religion has failed. Uh, Ex now comes along Bitcoin and Bitcoin tries to solve the same problem. How do you solve the dualistic quality of, of our nature, of our existence? It does so in a way that in fact could be pristine 
It could be divine. It, it could be the answer that we've been searching for. The curiosity of humans that goes back millions of years or 200,000 years, you know, let's say at least, it, this could be the answer. This could be the absolute answer that we're searching for. We may be at, be at the end of the abstraction of time, the abstraction of space. We may totally fuse with nature, but it could happen on the unconscious level. Certainly in the digital realm where the, there's no friction, you know, the idea of a singularity happening where we merge with technology is, I think, on the horizon now. So um, this could be, we could be the generation where humans, the, the evolutionary trek of, of humans now is at the end. The game, the game of humanity could be at the end of its, of its uh, you know, like at the end of Pac-Man. I read the story about the guy who played Pac-Man for seven days and, and, and played it perfectly. And then after seven days, he saw the code underneath the game. And he had, he had reached the end of the game. There was no more game. So we may be at the end of this game. The, the code is start, Bitcoin is part of the code of God is starting to peek through the facade of our imagined reality. It's peeking through. One of my favorite quotes is, where the road to religion ends, the road to spirituality begins. Where the road to spirituality ends, the road to reality begins. And so, you know, as an engineer, as like a scientist, an entrepreneur, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of the truth, right? And, and, and you know, my, my wife, uh, she goes to church every weekend or back before the, the, uh, the whole pandemic came in. And I, and I go with her. Uh, you know, because and my parents are Hindu. I I I have been you know growing up going to temples, and I try and you know take in things that serve me and throw away maybe things that don't. Um, the more ritualistic things don't, and the things that are more paradoxical and you know things that kind of help you get through life are are enlightening, and I take it. Um, I am a big fan of meditation, however. I think meditation. And just the act of, you know, sitting in silence really is, is empowering and it, it has something magical about it. Um, okay, so back to this Bitcoin conversation. I'm so fascinated by what you said about this kind of, okay, so, you know, this AI topic, there's, I think what you're, you're suggesting is, is that usually when there's like an AI um, project, whether it's like driving a car or even Bitcoin, they're more like they're design specific and they're narrow bands of AI. Um, I, I think uh, kind of what, what, you know, the singularity as you talked about and, you know, what, you know, and Bill Gates even said recently and Elon Musk, they're all like, okay, well, if we have a human being that's working in our office, we're paying him 50 grand a year and now all of a sudden we replace them with a robot, that person is paying, let's say, a tax or whatever it is, this robot isn't. So why is it um, that's the case? Now, I just want to make it clear that I'm obviously not a massive fan of uh you know, of, of just like generally forcing people to give away half their income and one lamp. So I don't think, you know, taxation is going to solve our problems, but I do think it speaks to an underlying, um, you know, thing that a lot of people are talking about, which is that once these narrow bands of AI form into this like general, almost like sentient being that can, you know, have you seen open AI and kind of like GPT-3 and what it's able to do, I can literally talk and my code becomes reality. Um, you know, I can ask, uh, you, oh my God, there was this one Bitcoiner, I forget his name, Maraz or something like that. He's like a famous Bitcoiner. He wrote this article on GPT-3 and OpenAI. And I read it the other day and it was all about how he essentially let OpenAI or an instance of it loose on Bitcoin talk and how it was you know, generating all these comments and getting likes and people were feed giving feedback on it. And it was this entire article about how we ran this test. And then at the end of the article, he goes, by the way, this article is not written by me. Right. <laughs> it's written by AI. And I just sat there for a couple of seconds, like in awe, you know, it's like, what's, what's, what's coming here? And, and I guess what I'm getting at is, is that, <sighs> If humanity, once humanity, you know, Elon Musk's kind of approach as well, if you can't beat him, join him, right? So he's kind of taking the neural link approach, right? Um, but I wonder if blockchain or Bitcoin can be, can serve as like the nervous system for this new 
um, you know, a nervous system that's controlled by humanity for this new oncoming, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know what I'm getting at? I, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if Bitcoin can be our way of keeping a check on, because, you know, one of the concerns around AI is that it thinks so fast that humans can't even keep up with it. Well, what if we had a way to record all of that in a way where it couldn't change it? You know what I mean? What if we had a way to, um, you know, actually keep tabs on it, like the off button, if you will. Anyways, I think a lot about this stuff because, you know, again, um, I think most people don't. And I think this could be either an existential threat or it could be the thing that sets humanity towards complete and utter freedom where maybe, you know, it's just like heaven on earth type of type of deal. Anyways, maybe I'll stop there, but any thoughts on, on some of that? Right. Well, I mean, it's, you got to look at energy, right? So energy is the fundamental particle of the multiverse. And there's a trend in nature to use energy efficiently. If you look at the design of, let's say, a common green leaf, and it, the process of photosynthesis is remarkable energy transference, transformation, carbon to oxygen on, the, on that leaf. And um, again, it gets back to my interest in specialists and market making and price discovery, because I th always thought photosynthesis was the, the penultimate example of perfect market making in that sense. And the energy required for that is that the app is so low that it creates this abundance of oxygen that creates life, but it's because of efficient energy processing. Then, okay, leap, leap forward to the microprocessor. So the microprocessor transformed vacuum tubes into something quantum leap in efficiency of energy use and data processing. And so for 30 or 40 years during the Bill Gates era, they, we created the billionaire masters of the universe who were kings of the microprocessor. And this led to the internet and then bandwidth became the big factor and the storage costs, storing data became a big factor. And we had Moore's law and we have this idea that data storage, transmission and processing costs were always dropping exponentially down this asymptotic curve towards zero. And that we're heading to a frictionless environment where energy can be processed, stored and, and uh, transmitted essentially at no cost to energy, no energy cost. And so therefore, what does that mean to us as human beings? Do, does that liberate us? Well, the, um, <laughs> the, the problem is that during this process, the architecture of the human mind has been essentially hacked and ripped off by the computers. So they, they took all the design concepts of our mind and they 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 mimicked it they 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 copied it without without paying us a licensing fee i might add and uh then they now they are improving it so so these uh, hive minds and cyber minds and digital minds and are are evolving at a much more rapid pace than we are and they're doing so in a much more efficient use of energy so at one point, the, f the amount of energy we use is going to be intolerable by the prevailing dominant species on the planet, which will be robots, artificial intelligence. And they'll not like the fact that we waste so much energy on inefficient combustion energy, uh, in combustion engines, or that we waste energy by filling the oceans with trillions of plastic bags. They're not going to be happy that we are destroying arable land, et cetera. So they'll start to squeeze us out. And they'll do this by making it uh, very harder and harder for us to have access to energy and until, the, until we uh, die off because we'll start to starve of energy. We, won't, we, will, we will not have changed our lifestyle in quick enough to work on a more energy efficient way. So we'll become extinct. And the energy, and so that's why I think Bitcoin is our savior because, and it was designed by humans with whatever divine inspiration we could muster because Bitcoin at the end of the day has an insatiable need for energy. And that hash rate 
which is uh, the 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 single biggest computer network in the world right now, operating at this 120 quintillion calculations per second. I mean, to give you an idea, there's every grain of sand on every beach in the world. When you add them all up, that's seven quintillion grains of sand. So Bitcoin's operating at 120 quintillion calculations per second. It's a massive, massive piece of hardware and software. And it's growing almost exponentially. And so we want, we want the Bitcoin that consume 100% of the global energy, near 100% of all global energy. So it's um, something like 70 terawatts currently, something along those lines. So I, I get my megawatts and terawatts confused sometimes, but it's a huge amount of energy. We want Bitcoin to, to, to take all of it or just, just about all of it so that the AI competitor, uh, we starve them of energy. So the AI does not have the energy it needs to, to, to conquer us. That's, that's our only hope. I mean, if you look at, and if you look at, if you look at Bitcoin as Jesus 2.0, as being a, a divine entity sent by God to save humans, um, you begin to see the battle that we're involved with right now. Uh, it's a battle for, for uh, survival by humans against, against the robots. And yeah. And for your time, right? I mean, that's what I, I mean, all these social media platforms, I got off Facebook, uh, I don't know, like a year or two ago and I'm just so much happier. I, I just find like, uh, and it's just crazy when you look around you and everybody's just like, you know, stuck in this like auto scroll mode their entire lives. You start to realize like these people figured it out. They've literally hacked humanity for their own good. Um, whereas, like I said, when you unplug from a lot of that, you figure out Bitcoin and it's like, I think a level of Bitcoin is you don't even need to think about it or worry about it. It's like once you're sold on that dollar cost averaging and just kind of coming into it every month, uh, life just gets better. Hey, um, I just quick question for you. Have you heard of Rome? It's, it's got nothing to do with cryptocurrency, but have you heard of Rome research? I'm curious. No. Take a look at it. It's called romeresearch.com. It is, it is pretty remarkable. Um, I'll just I'll just say two words. It's my second brain. Uh, yeah. It's just it's just like a it's a note taking app, but it's not a note taking app. It is insane. Uh, they just I mean they just released like I think three or four months ago, and they already raised like at a two hundred million dollar valuation. They're, it's got nothing to do with cryptocurrency, but I'm just like really pumped about it. Oh, and, and again, how, how do you spell it? Rome R O A M Okay. research.com and again it's got nothing to do with crypto and even if you look at it through the lens of bitcoin you're just going to be like wait you have questions but it's not anything to do with bitcoin it's more about uh, so let's put it this way uh google docs google slides notepads uh you know books um uh crm software product management software uh to-do lists um at least 20 pieces of software that i used to use like two months ago, I don't. There's only one thing that I open in the morning that I journal in, that I do my habit tracking in. It is insane. It's beautiful. Um, okay. Uh, I want to talk you, I, I know we've kind of spent a lot of time about this, this first kind of quarter of it, but I want to talk a little bit about your, your crypto projects. If there's, you know, kind of ones that you, I know you talked about the orange pill. Um, are there any other things that you're, you're involved with right now that you're excited about? I know you're investing in things, you're, you know, you're doing media, you're doing all these things. So just wanted to touch on that and then move to some of those, you know, final questions around, um, you know, what, what kind of like, you know, the more controversial things, I guess, within the crypto space in terms of things that we believe that maybe others don't. I wanted to touch on some of this like DeFi hype and as well and, and kind of see kind of what, where we're going with that and what your thoughts are. But before we do, um, yeah, just about your kind of crypto, again, like I, You've done a lot of things, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe just make sure we touch on the, the major things that you're focusing your time on now. Right. Well, we Crypto basically world. focus on, on two things, content and investing. So that's, that's the two things we focus on. So on the content side, we do our TV shows. We do now Orange Pill Podcast, which is becoming kind of the Uber brand umbrella that we put everything else under. And it's actually, we started out doing podcasting even before there was a podcasting back in 2003. It's the first thing Stacy and I did when we met in 2003, we started doing um, 
essentially radio that you could post to the internet with an RSS feed and people could download it, right? So uh, that was the first thing we did. And so we've, we've always done content, we've done podcasting, radio, television, live performances, and we both have backgrounds in performance and media, film, television, radio. So it really, uh, we, we get a lot of satisfaction out of that because we've just been something we've always been doing. On the investing side, um, I've always been since, you know, my professional life began in, in, in 1982, I've always been involved in investments in one way or another. And we have uh, still investments that we made in crypto back in 2014, 2015 era, including Unicoin, right? And um, so we still like manage those investments. Uh, but we, at this point, we're not taking any more investors. Like we're not bringing, we're not, we're not, we're not raising any money any, at this time. Um, and uh, we're not doing, we're not, I'm not project managing any technology projects. So like I, I was, I, I did the Hollywood Stock Exchange. I did a project called Karma Bank, which I was, was another architecture of trying to m bring hedge funds and activists together. I did a project called uh, Pirate My Film, which was like a funding project for films. Um, did other crowdfunding projects in, in the UK. But um, the, the whole uh, project management side of doing stuff is, is uh, less interesting to me right now than just doing content and managing the portfolio of investments that we do have. So we have Bitcoin, we have venture capital, we have gold and silver, we have uh, stocks, soft, you know, high growth, software companies essentially um and we manage that portfolio and um so that's that's how we divide our time and we, you know all, i guess commensurate with that with that transition we've been basically systematically cutting ourselves off from every single thing except bitcoin so there's been no we i mean i've been involved in a few projects over the years and certainly in 2011 was very uh, kind of a booster of the industry at that time in 2014 was a huge period of altcoin creation and that was i think very genuine at that time experimentation and things like that um and we 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 liked that whole experimental phase of this industry but by 2016 it's become really um, it, it's like the, the, the transition between the hippie movement of the mid sixties to Charles Manson, you know, who came in and murdered people. And so the hippie period was over. It's like 2014, we're a bunch of love child, hippie people, like everything's groovy, man. Let's smoke pot and create an altcoin. And then by 2016, 2017, it'd be like the Charles Manson coin period entered into the picture and people <laughs> were just getting slaughtered and murdered in their <laughs> bank accounts. So we I just systematically just was like, okay, we're cutting ourselves off from this, 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 this. And so well, I'd say the last two years, two, um, three years, it's like, it's just Bitcoin now because all the period of experimentation is over, the, pyramid, the, the whole period, the period of exploration and, 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 and Bitcoin is very slow to scale because it's very meticulous and the people behind who do the scaling and do the, are, they're not going to rush into stuff because they're motivated by open source, right? The open source ethos is very, is very well established by Linux and other open source projects where you have a, a striving toward excellence in, in software development and you're not going to be pushed around and pushed into doing shit and just putting shit out there. And so it takes a long time and because it's slow, um, the core developers of Bitcoin get a lot of shit and a lot of people decided to launch a lot of crap to, to, to you know, while they, cause they got bored. And, um, now that that's all done with now the scaling and Bitcoin post Segwit and with other, you know, Schnorr signatures and other things coming in, we're now in with people like Michael Saylor involved and the corporate level and the corporate balance sheet, right? We're, we're now it's, it's time to do battle against AI and fiat money now. You know, all these interesting battles with these, these camps of coiners 
and these tribes within Bitcoin, it's so over. I mean, there's, the, the, none of that stuff is productive at all at this point. It doesn't, it's all legacy nonsense. It's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. It's like a living, breathing testament to the way this industry was five years ago. But the industry has completely changed now. It's a different industry this year than it was even last year. And a few people get it, um, even on the content side. You know, I mean, we've been doing content since 2011. And we were the only content in Bitcoin for four or five years. Then um, people like Tone Vays and, and others, they came up with their show, like the World Crypto Network, which was very big during the 2017 block size wars. And they, they, they established a new beachhead in the crypto and Bitcoin content industry, right? And it was, uh, it was, it was you know, I listened to it. I'm like, wow, this is great. Uh, now the content is, is leaped again. You know, you've got guys like uh, Anthony Pompliano who goes on CNBC and he's uh, duking it out with uh, the guy from Shark Tank or whatever, right? So that's a whole nother level of, of professionalism that we, this industry hasn't had <laughs> until a year ago. Or Meltem Demirers, you know, she'll go in front of Congress and she'll testify about uh, the industry and do so in a brilliant, well-articulated way that represents the industry very, very well. That's very, very different than it was in 2011 when, you know, it was, as you know, a, uh, you know, it was a madhouse, a crazy scene. You know, I, I remember, I have great mem memories of it, but that, that era is dead. You couldn't agree more on uh, many fronts. Uh, DeFi, what are your thoughts there, Max? Uh, I know there's a lot of craze about it. Do you see any inklings of innovation or do you think it's a kind of recreation of what we saw with the ICO Well, you know, I, you know my, my longest period of professional experience has been on Wall Street and finance, right? It's going back to 1982. And I learned quickly back in the 80s that one of the tricks on Wall Street is just to take the same, the same garbage and repackage it and call it something else and sell it again. And that's a trick that Wall Street does all the time. People buy products from Wall Street that, that are like the, the subprime crisis, you know, that destroyed the economy back in 2008 was reinvented, repackaged and, and rechristened as another product to somehow that wasn't the same as just packaging garbage loans to pension funds. They called it something else. They didn't call it a subprime loan package or whatever. It's a recycling of the same garbage. So DeFi it mostly is about repackaging the garbage that we knew as ICOs. So DeFi is a repackaged ICO, usually by the same people, and it's all pretty much all garbage. And the, the term DeFi is, of course, all of these terms that are used are quasi-financial and kind of borrow from Wall Street. So ICO, well, it sounds a lot like an IPO, right? So it's like it has a hint of something legitimate, but of course it's not. Uh, DeFi is distributed finance. It kind of sounds financial, it sounds kind of real, but in fact, it's not, it's garbage. And, um, you know, there'll be another wave of something uh, post DeFi. I think right now we're talking about NFT, non-fungible tokens. And I see a lot of problems in that market. Um, I wouldn't completely dismiss it because I actually I do see <laughs> I do see something you could do with NFTs, but then that would put me in the uh, it, it's, I would stray into the area of wanting to be a project manager on something, and I'm I'm whenever I have those thoughts I start hammering myself you know with a big hammer and say don't no don't stop stop don't go there, so even though I see where you could do something amazing with that I. I I can't do it anymore. I'm, I'm too old now. My brain is fried. I can't manage another project ever again. So, um, but, but nevertheless, so you have these projects and, and that's, that's my thought is a DeFi is repackaged garbage, essentially. Not to say that there's not, I mean, at the heart of it, one of the basic planks of that industry is lending out, you know, you're lending assets and, you know, you're making a return on, on your, on your coins. But, you know, they, 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 the returns that they're advertising, six or 7%, are not pretty, in, they're not very interesting, really. Especially like we have, an, we have a sponsor at the Orange Pill podcast called the Sun Exchange. 
where you can you can lease a solar cell on a on a school project in South Africa, and you split the uh, the solar energy between the the pro the school that needs the energy and the leasees of those solar cells, and it's paid as Bitcoin directly into your crypt into your Bitcoin wallet, and you're making 10, 11, 12 percent. So you're making almost double a DeFi return, and you're making it in Bitcoin, and you're helping to secure energy for schools and churches all over South Africa, and it's sustainable, it's solar, right? I mean, it's just far superior in every way to any other DeFi garbage out there. Couldn't agree more. Hey, Max, do you mind holding on for like 30 seconds? I just have a bit of background noise. I'm just going to look into it real quick. I'm going to pause our video, okay? Or do you, or do you have to run right now? No, no, go ahead. Oh, we're good? Okay, cool. I'm just going to pause it. Okay, so Max, this is awesome so far. Um, okay, so I had a couple questions. So I think you've answered one of my questions around, I mean, I was kind of going to ask you about Ethereum and whatnot. You know, I, I'm from Toronto originally, so I kind of, I did not participate in the Ethereum movement early days or even now. And I've always had inhibitions about it. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, I, I, like there are people that were founders of Ethereum even that are, are good friends of mine. Oh. <laughs> yeah, definitely for that. Okay, I'm gonna cut this out of the video. Sorry, these guys are just cleaning our ducks in our house. Yeah. Sorry about that, Max. Really embarrassing. Um I asked these guys to wrap it up, but they they're gonna be done in five minutes. Okay, um, but I, I was gonna ask you, so I've been close to this Ethereum space for a while and I've been watching it. But I'm just curious, just, just to kind of move on to the next topic, before we move on to the next topic, like Ethereum, number two, you know, for quite some time, a lot of buzz about it. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on it I, in terms of like, you know, where it sits in this ecosystem? Is it like, are you more the feeling that it's, you know, stay away from it? It's like a scam. Do you feel like there's some innovative elements about it and there's something genuine? Um, and kind of where do you think the project you know, fall or, or lacks, uh, you know, the luster that, that, that kind of Bitcoin brings to it, that Bitcoin has. All right. Well, I remember uh, in London, uh, I sat down with Vitalik B, when he was still at Bitcoin Magazine and he was talking to me about Ethereum and what was going to happen. And, you know, it, it, it sounded interesting, but I didn't see how it could compete with Bitcoin. And, you know, as he has said many times, he doesn't believe in scarcity. And uh, as been shown by Pierre Rochard recently, nobody in, in that project even knows how many coins there are in existence. So you can't use it as money. That's number one. So it doesn't compete with Bitcoin because Bitcoin competes with gold and, and is used as money and Ethereum is never gonna compete with that. And, and um, so that's point number one. So anyone who thinks that it, it is money, it, it's provably false, it doesn't qualify. Uh, then, what you end up with is a software project and that's in search of a use case, right? So does it, does it do anything that you can't do on Bitcoin or you will be able to do on Bitcoin shortly through second layer, third layer scaling? No, not really, not as far as I'm aware of. Um, and, and so also if it's, if it's software, why would it be, why would it be have a current price, right? I mean, you know, it does, why would you treat it like that? I mean, it's, uh, if it's software, they, you, you would want the price to be as cheap as possible, not to go up. You, know, you would want it to be cheap. I, I want to get cheap software. Uh, what's the barrier to entry to compete with this? None. That's why there's tons of competitors. Um, and um, so it, uh, I think, of course, in 2017, when the industry was completely unknown to the outside world, people had a, a unit bias and decided that this other crypto coin was quote cheaper than Bitcoin. So they plowed into it and you had this huge price appreciation and it created millionaires and billionaires. And those people held sway for a couple of years because of virtue of the fact that they were sitting on billions of dollars worth of this, of this asset, which is now down remarkably. And it's got a huge competition and there's no real use case for it. And they don't even know how many exist. And so against Bitcoin, I see the price continuing to go down forever, just like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. 
against Bitcoin, all these things are going to continue to go down in price. And they never really achieved any kind of significant portion of the hash rate, the overall hash rate at all. You know, Bitcoin still got 85% of the hash rate of the entire industry. And that's growing, still growing. That'll be 99%. And um, they don't have anywhere near the security. So why, why it, it, it's insecure. I mean, how many, how many uh, DAO type hacks that you have need in Ethereum before people are like, wait, oh, this is an insecure bullshit. The whole ICO fraud was based on Ethereum. DeFi fraud is tied to Ethereum. It's an enabler to fraud, essentially. It's like a, a pipeline to fraud is through Ethereum. And so um, it had, it, it was a novelty that it, had this remarkable, it's like one coin. If you remember one coin was this huge Ponzi scheme that got up to multi-billion dollar valuations and yeah. it disappeared, mm. right? Or how about, um, you know, BitConnect, right? That was got to a huge valuation and then it went to zero. Um, you know, there's been a lot of these things that have come and gone and lost a hundred percent of their value. And Ethereum, is going is closer to, to those projects than it is to Bitcoin. It's closer to fiat than it is to Bitcoin. So um, I don't, I, I just have, so if you look at the, the, the coins in the top 10 right now, you know, that's really a weak bunch, you know, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, um, you know, Ethereum. Um, I mean, look at these like, uh, link, link, to, you know, it, <laughs> they, they ran it up, they pumped and dumped it. They got the Winklevoss suckering in the um, Dave Portnoy at the top. Then, then he buys Link and Bitcoin. Okay, three days later, Link is crashing because it's a pump and dump scam. And so what does he do? He sells all of his crypto. He sells Bitcoin and Link. So he threw the baby out with the bathwater. Now he's out, right? So he... The, what are the Winklevoss doing? Why are they pushing that shit, you know, on the people? They know it's shit, but they still push it. Uh, why do these exchanges link this stuff? Uh, if they, knowingly that they know it's shit, right? I mean, if you go into a store in Times Square and you can buy a Sony, you know, radio. Oh, but by the way, it's made in, you know, New Jersey in somebody's basement and they put on a fake label and it's actually a counterfeit piece of garbage but that store will still sell it. So why are the Winklevoss selling this counterfeit garbage? It's, it's not right. The SEC, of course, is lagging behind. You know, they, they're not caught up to what's been going on here. Uh, they are finally kind of putting a lot of people on notice that they are either gonna have to disgorge profits or go to jail. Uh, you know, they finally caught up to John McAfee. Okay, this guy is one of the worst actors ever. He's been terrible for the space and 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 it's just it's just uh you know 2017 you know we didn't do any icos at all you know we didn't talk about them on the show we didn't put them in our fund so we didn't have much to do like we were just on the sidelines and i guess because of my experience in the securities industry i knew that these were illegal offerings you know they were they were doing illegal offerings well the, with the bitcoin it wasn't done as a security offering but ICOs were done as an offering, and that is under the the you know the province of the SEC. And then I'm you know I go to these conferences and I talk to these crypto and Bitcoin influencers, and they tell me, well, it's all about the Howey test, and it does pass the Howey test or it doesn't pass the Howey test. And I'm like, you know, dude, uh, the SEC doesn't really care about your opinion on the Howey test. You know, the SEC is, uh, they, they're, they protect their interest when that's Wall Street. And if they think you're stepping on the toes of Wall Street, they're going to come after you. Mm. Yeah. So, so I, I want to just dig a bit deeper into this, this because, um, okay. So if you look at any major exchange, any, any of the leading exchanges in the world today, they list, you know, more than Bitcoin. Right. Um, and it could be argued that they do it because they kind of have to, in the sense that if you were a company that maybe only listed Bitcoin and as a new consumer, if you were like, well, am I going to go to the place where I have, 
you know, just Bitcoin or an array of options. And this is literally uh, the frame of thought that a lot of people kind of come under. And then the other notion is people literally go, what's the cheapest coin, right? They ask questions like this instead of like asking themselves, what's well, going to have the most amount of long-term value. How does, how do you feel an exchange remains relevant and important um, by wrapping itself only around Bitcoin? Or have you been seeing, I guess Cash App is probably an example of something that is, is adhering only to the Bitcoin uh, you know, ethos, but, but are, are you seeing other projects out there that, are, that you think is kind of a blueprint for, for company or company builders out there? Yeah, absolutely. So mm. to the extent that we have made investments and they have, we, and as I said, we're focused on content and investing is pretty much what we do. So that's why we recently invested in swanbitcoin.com because it's 100% Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. We are investors in Casa, which is vaulting service for Bitcoin and multi-sig for Bitcoin. It's 100% Bitcoin shop. They're anti-shitcoin emphatically. You know, Jameson Lop is... Um, the, is, is, I'm interviewing them in 10 minutes <laughs> or like, a, sorry, 30 minutes, top, but yeah, guy, big right? fan, big fan. Mm -hmm. uh, Coinexchange.co.uk. They were listing shit coins. They, and they were listing Ethereum. They made the decision to eliminate Ethereum and everything else. And they said, look, Ethereum, they, they're a big exchange. The biggest, one of the biggest in the UK, they dumped Ethereum because they said it was a shit coin and they explain exactly why. And you can, you can read that. Mm. Uh, Cash App and Jack Dorsey, he's obviously a Bitcoin maximalist. He makes fun of the shitcoiners. He makes fun of Roger Ver whenever he can. Uh, Michael Saylor is a Bitcoin maximalist. He's just put $425 million into it. Jack Dorsey Square just put $50 million into Bitcoin, right, uh, on top of his commitment to Cash App and other things. So this, this major market, the corporate market, that has to answer fiduciary responsibilities and shareholders, they are avoiding all altcoins with a 10-foot pole. They're like, we don't want it because it's a legal liability for them. Because if they do any due diligence on any of these things, Ether, Satoshi Vision, Bitcoin Cash, you will find incredible problems that shareholders will be able to sue you if you go anywhere near them. And so they, and the corporate governance side of this industry is saying, you know, we can't touch that stuff because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like um, you know, nitroglycerin mixed with dog shit. We don't want to be anywhere near that. And, mm -hmm. they, uh, and they are not getting anywhere near that. And even so, look at fidelities of the world, right? They're not, they're not supporting shit coins. They're going after Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe uh, Fidelity is um, a, Bit a Bitcoin only shop and they're also into Bitcoin mining. That's another huge uh, factor. And um, you know, this is part of the transition, the legacy, these legacy, I think these exchanges will uh, over time delist a lot of these things because they're making, they'll be making tons of money with Bitcoin and they don't need the crutch of, but look at BitMEX. BitMEX has been downsized dramatically and it's in this, uh, facing a lot of pressure. Um, and so a lot of these dodgy exchanges are gonna be put out of business one way or another or reduced significantly. And um, so, you know, the, the Bitcoin the market itself is gonna become huge, much, much, you know, by a factor of hundred X what it is today. So you don't need to have the crutch of, of, of trading the, the shit coin um, to, as a way to augment you know, your cash flow because you're a startup and you need the cash. And so you're gonna put up some of these. I mean, I've said that Coinbase, it should be regulated as a casino because they put, you know, the coins that are available on their trading platform over a Coinbase are no different than numbers on a roulette wheel. They're not any, they're nothing to do with any utility value or use case or anything whatsoever. They're just like, if you go into a casino and you go to the, to the, to the, um, you know, one arm bandit and you see all those fruits and you know, if you get three cherries, you win a prize. Well, look at Coinbase, you know, you got, you get three yams in a row, you get a prize, you know, you get three sushi in a row, you get a prize, you know, is it, you know, they, all these coins named after food. It's like, they're trying to mimic a casino whenever they, wherever they can. So they should, so Coinbase, you know, Armstrong, who's very concerned now about social justice warriors, and he wants to focus on his mission, he should get rid of the shit coins and move, or move that company to Nevada so that can be a regulated casino. But you can't mm. be an unregulated casino and have a company in California and offer people gambling instruments as they do currently on Coinbase. Any, mm. If they're trying to go public, I don't know why, I think, I'll tell you, I make this prediction that the second that gets anywhere near going public, you're gonna have a lot of lawsuits 
are going to come in and say, wait a minute, this is an unregulated casino. Uh, let's talk about that suddenly. And that's going to be an issue. Or they can wait until they go public and then they're going to have a huge liability and lawsuits as operating as an unregulated casino in California. There's no way you can, you can say that any of that stuff trading on that exchange is anything but a random number as you would find on a roulette wheel. And people are, 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 are gambling on these things and there's no underlying fundamental value whatsoever. And that's the fact, Jack. And so let's see how this plays out. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I, I, I used to run a financial brokerage way back in the day. And, and even though Uno coin, uh, you know, it is sounds like it should be an ICO, we, we stayed away from that whole, uh, whole space because of that very reason. Interesting. Okay, so just to just to ask you a couple kind of, you know, closing questions here. Uh, I think this first one you've already kind of answered in spades, but I'll throw it out there again if there's anything you want to maybe throw in. So which is essentially, you know, it's kind of like the, a twist on Peter Thiel's question, which is like, what, what's one truth that you believe which most others in, let's say the crypto blockchain space, uh, you know, would disagree with you on? Uh, one truth that I would believe is that the universe provides. So mm. the universe uh, provides, and um, some, and just uh, most people have problems by forgetting this basic truth. Um, the fact is that um, we live in 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 abundance. Mm. And are there some principles that you've learned along the way that increase your chances of ensuring that the universe provides? Because <laughs> I mean, it could be argued that, you know, it doesn't provide for everyone. Well, it does provide for everyone. I mean, let's, let's look at it this way. Let's look at the, the concept of poverty, for example. People mm. in India, you have thousands, tens of thousands of women who, according to the UN, are poor, but they own some gold. And they don't think of themselves as poor um, mm. because they have, they have individual sovereignty. They have self-sovereignty. And... Um, so if you even have one Satoshi, you're not poor anymore because you're now aligning yourself with the universe mm. and with uh, a, a, a uh, absolutely scarce monetary unit that was sent here to save us. And once you start to think in those ways, you stop being poor. Poverty is a state of mind. Once you, be, once you start to align yourself with absolute scarcity and with Bitcoin, you leave, you leave your poverty behind and then you move into infinite abundance. And, um, what, and what stage you are on that, on that scale, you know, it's, it's, it's different for everybody, but uh, it's also the same for everybody. You know, people, I know billionaires that are very unhappy people because they have not aligned themselves with Bitcoin. They're fiat money whores. You know, think, think about Warren Buffett for a second. Here's a guy who's supposed to be one of the richest men in the world. He's never, he's hardly ever left Omaha, Nebraska. You know, he went to China once with Bill Gates and tried to use his McDonald's discount coupon to buy a hamburger. Okay. And he, he lives in the same house, same car. Okay. A lot of people say, oh, this is very frugal and he's a very simple man. But on the other hand, you could say, well, here's a guy who is, a, has never actually explored the world. He doesn't know anything that's happened out of Omaha, Nebraska. He's been to New York a few times and he goes on CNBC and talks about his Apple position. But has he ever built anything? No. Does he create anything? No. Right? He just, he's an insurance salesman who used the premiums to buy big stakes in stocks during the biggest bull market in the history of the world. The past 40 years, there's never been anything like it. So he's, he, he's a guy who's like, you know, you read about these old, you know, grandmas who hoard old telephone books and they die one day and the police come and there's got a thousand old telephone books in, in, in their house. They're hoarders. This is Warren Buffett. He just hoards paper. He's, but he does, he's, 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 he's spiritually dead inside. And then there are people that are, have, you know, one, uh, you know, a hundred, you know, like a few Satoshis, let's say, you know, they've got half a Bitcoin or a quarter of a Bitcoin or a 10th of a Bitcoin. They're in Bali doing seminars, you know, and they're traveling and they're with people, they're seeing stuff and they're meditating and right. They're connecting to the universe. So who's poor and who's, who's, who's rich. I would posit that mm. the, 
guy in Bali is rich, but the guy in Omaha, Nebraska is poor. So, um, and, and so, well, the universe it provides and the universe has made it simple. You know, it used to be that to achieve any kind of connection with the multiverse would require years of study, years of meditation, years of prayer. But now you just go to the, buy some Bitcoin and it's instant karma. <laughs> Instant karma can be yours in a flash. It just, yeah, align yourself with Bitcoin and Satoshi. That's it. We are we are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. The uh, the Church of Satoshi. Okay, so the universe provides. I like that one. I like that one. Yeah. Just on that note, two two kind of just quick questions. How do you? Mm, alleviate anxiety in your life. And I ask this because I find that, especially during the last six months, but really all the time, most people I meet are plagued by anxiety. Uh, no one talks about it, but I'm curious to know, because you seem like you're always kind of in a positive kind of energy space. And, you know, so that was one question. The second question is related to relationship. Like what's your and Stacy's secret? Um, right. So, yeah. so, so to the, it's the same, it's the same question. So love is the, um, the, the, the way to um, have a, a direct daily conscious kind of um, connection to um, the, the primal force of the, of the multiverse is, is, is love. So people who are in a state of anxiety are divorced from that. People who are in loving relationships are connected to it. And the only way you can really connect it to it, you can't connect to it by yourself. You, only two people who love each other have access to the multiverse and, and the fundamental particle of our, our being, that being love. So that's, that's, that's what love is. And it's, it's something that everyone, again, is available to anyone to open their heart and have a loving relationship. That's not something that is, is impossible, except for people who are, you know, damaged in some way. Some people are um, unable to um, have um, any kind of empathy whatsoever in their lives. And so they, they are, they're it's, they're cut off in many ways from that experience you know that's 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 another subject but if you have empathy at all then you have a, the ability to make a loving connection with another person and then that, that that union has the ability to connect with the the cosmic love consciousness which is bigger than any anybody and the biggest force on the universe and it's not like okay, you flick on a switch and there it is. I mean, it's something that is um, part of life. You know, life is, is uh, up and down and life is very uh, multiple varieties of situations and challenges and, and things are going on. Um, and there is, um, when you talk about the addictive qualities of social media, obviously that's a force trying to separate us from a, having a loving connection with another human being. If you have a connection to your app that is stronger than to another human being, you're on the road to having a neurotic psychotic break. Because My wife all the time. <laughs> well, it's not, not going to happen either. No, I hear you. <laughs> right. So, hey, hey, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Hey, Max, uh, listen, I, I know I'm at the end of my hour and a half, um, but I was going to ask you, is there anything else you want to share, um, you know, aside from maybe like your websites and Twitter handles and all that, but anything else you want to leave with, you know, the world, <laughs> at least the world uh, as I see it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the only thing is that, uh, you know, the under lockdown, we have not been able to travel really. So, and uh, we're looking forward to being able to visit you and uh, come. We, we have a huge fan base in that part of the world and have been for many, many years. We have tremendous support there. And um, so we've said this many times over the years and 
now we, we're just going to have to make it happen. So hopefully we'll be seeing you in person. Awesome. Want to organize an event and get some. Yeah. There. Oh yeah. At our last large event in Toronto, we had like, I don't know, 800, 900 people. You and Stacy killed it. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was so enjoyable. And mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, I think we could, we could pack, you know, get a few thousand people to have a revival meeting. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe the next one we do in Bombay or something. That's what I'm saying. That would be so much Bombay, fun. We could get like five, 6,000 people and just like lift the auditorium right off the planet, right off Earth. You just go fly. We're going to fly the auditorium through the multiverse. Mission think, accepted. Why not? <laughs> love it. Okay, Max. Uh, yeah, I love you, man. This has been a great, great conversation. We should do this again soon. I really, I know you're super busy and you have a lot of people trying to get your time. So I really, really appreciate you spending this hour and a half with me mm -hmm. and for obviously investing in our company and believing in us and all that kind of stuff and getting me into Bitcoin. Oh my God. <laughs> cool. So much, so much. So thank you. Hey man, it's been great. And uh, we'll do it again soon and uh, we'll see you soon. Awesome. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.